before that, I was a practicing attorney for uh, many years doing transactional work. Uh, it's great to be here today. Thanks so much, Aaron. And thank you, Casey, for moderating and Colin for organizing. I'm Basha Rubin, CEO and co-founder of Priori. Priori is a legal marketplace for in-house teams to find, hire, and manage a global vetted network of attorneys that claims of all sizes. Our clients are Fortune 500s and fast-growing technology companies who see us as a way to reduce their outside counsel spending, increase the diversity of their outside counsel relationships and ident identify local counsel niche expertise and overall create more flexibility in their outside counsel program. Uh, my name is Lonnie Cornby. I'm uh, Associate General Counsel and Managing Director at Bank of America. And similar to Aaron, uh, who I've known for years, uh, we have uh, operations roles. Um, so I manage outside counsel management. I have vendor management. Um, our external spend, um, forecasting and budget. Um, I also have the e-discovery group. So, you know, sometimes I refer to myself as the mutt of the department because I do a little bit of everything. Great. Uh, well, to the, to the audience, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we are going to reserve 15 minutes at the end for Q&A. Uh, even before that, I invite you uh, to let us know what you're thinking and what you want to hear in the, in the chat function. Uh, and then also an invitation to the to the panelists uh, to limit the amount that I speak. I will ask multi-part uh, questions. Uh, answer that in which you are most interested. Feel free to throw other parts of your questions to your other panelists. And by the same token, other panelists, uh, you know, within the, within the bounds of decorum, please chime in um, because I am sure that all of you have opinions on all of these questions. And in fact, knowing all of you, I, I know that those opinions uh, diverge in a way that will be very interesting uh, for the audience. So uh, with that, I'm going to start with you, uh, Lonnie, um, and, and with why. Let's start with why. Why do formal outside council management programs even exist? What is the problem being solved? And what are the benefits being sought? Um, well, outside council management is, is very important and you know, part of the topic is how we're leveraging our outside council relationships. Um, and I have to say, I'm here today um, with at a friend's uh, company, McGuire Woods, um, who we do a lot of work with. Um, we're not back in the office yet um, and our bank computers um, can't access this website. So um, our partners at Bank of America were um, nice enough to open up their office doors to me and, and set me up on, on the, in this great conference room. So I have to say thanks to McGuire Woods. Um, now to answer your question, um, you know, I see Tamar on, on the, the website, you know, put in a, a, a chat um, about the litigation roundtable program. Um, this is a program that we launched uh, several years ago, and it was more of a convergence effort um, you know, to minimize the number of law firms that we use um, you know, for, for similar type of work. So we started um, at about 700 law firms. Um, and you know, now we're down to uh, 23 that do the majority of our defensive litigation and regulatory work. So um, as part of this convergence program, bankwide, globally, um, we have about, I would say 80% of our spend is with about 40 firms and 95% of our spend is only with 150. Um, of course, we need um, you know, law firms and vendors all over the world um, in a local capacity, um, but you, as you can see, we've kind of transferred a lot of our work to a smaller number of firms. And I can't overstate the importance of having um, a formal outside counsel management program. And in fact, the ACC has said um, in a recent study that it's the hallmark of a mature legal department for us, having this formal approach um, has helped us to you know, leverage that power, um, that partnership, those relationships with our law firms. It has a host of benefits, including um, negotiation of fixed fees and value-based billing, volume discounts, um, efficiencies and engagement 
Um, you know, you're probably going to hear some of us talk about, you know, information security um, and making sure that the confidential information from, you know, our clients is protected. We are a retail bank. We want to make sure that all of the information um, that is, is, you know, from a data transmission standpoint is protected. Um, you know, they understand our business, our clients, our needs. Um, we also improve the overall level of service with our law firms by providing them you know, really robust um, you know, information and performance reviews, um, the, in addition to providing just real-time feedback you know, every single uh, day to our, our law firm partners. Um, but this performance review process is, is really robust. It's important. It allows us to get two-way feedback. So how can we, as Bank of America, be a better partner to our law firm and vendor population? And then we give them feedback not only from um, an operational standpoint, from a financial standpoint, um, but we do get feedback from um, all of the in-house lawyers um, that work with um, our law firm partners. And I know this is gonna be shocking to everybody, but our law firm partners are competitive by nature. So if you tell them that they're over or underperforming um, in comparison with their, their peers, you know, that's gonna solicit um, real powerful change. Um, so, you know, again, we're a heavy regulated um, company, a retail bank. Um, you know, so we want to make sure that we're working with the right partners that are going to give us quality legal services um, at reasonable pricing. Wonder wonderful. And so, Aaron, Lonnie just mentioned panel programs right from the outset. In fact, when we think about outside council management, we're, we closely associate that with convergence initiatives and, and, and panels. Now, often the, the headline objectives there are, well, we're going to save we're going to save lots of money and we're also going to reduce our administrative burden. So those data security audits, we have to do them with, with, with fewer firms, but isn't there an inherent tension there? Um, because if we go with fewer firms don't we have to go with larger firms and aren't larger firms more expensive. So is that an actual tension? And if so, how do you resolve it? Um, and what, it, what does that question miss about, panel programs and convergence initiatives. After Great. Aaron, I'm going to jump in on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Noted. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Um, so I, I would I would say there, there may be a tension there. And I, I always try to start from uh, the principle that you have to have the right program for your needs as a consumer of legal services. So um, at the end of the day, um, you know, our clients, uh, whether at, at SoftBank or other businesses that I've worked with, um, will have uh, specific needs that are unique to the kind of work that they do. And um, those needs may be local, they may be global, uh, they may be, um, you know, very general. Uh, if you are operating in a small department um, that has, uh, you know, discrete needs that come up from time to time, or they may be, you know, highly frequent and uh, uh, high, high volume. And so, you know, I think the type of program that you design for managing your relationships with outside counsel needs to be driven by your client's needs and the goals. And so, it, uh, you know, Casey, you observed um, working with larger firms does, uh, occasionally mean that there is more overhead um, to manage, um, you know, more offices, uh, it, other uh, costs. Um, there are also efficiencies uh, that can be achieved uh, through size and through scale. And so, it, you know, I try to be driven by, uh, in the first instance, um, you know, finding the right firms for our clients at the right value. And sometimes that can be uh, achieved through convergence. Um, through uh, realizing some of the benefits that Lonnie described. So, um, you know, offering your law firm partners the opportunity to do more business over time with clients. Sometimes it can be uh, provided by a, a larger group if, if that suits the need. Um, so I, I think in a lot of these programs, what you find is a balancing and um, it, there's really no one size fits all solution. Um, it needs to be tailored to the specific needs of the organization. And you realize those needs through getting to know your client. Right. Uh, so 
So I, I would just jump in and say this is something that we see a lot of priori. This is exactly the space where we play. That large corporate legal departments have very successful panel initiatives that make a whole lot of sense. You're spending, you know, in, in some cases, hundreds of millions of dollars each year on outside counsel, being able to both understand where that money is going and creating ways to for account, accountability and transparency about those dollars and feedback loops um, is. Is 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 really I, I think the only the only path to the future for most for most companies. With that said, companies come to priori for those exceptions when they're looking for local counsel in Tuscaloosa for a case that needs to we need to stand up in court tomorrow, and you need someone who understands who's in the local market and understands it where there are niche forms of expertise that can't be accessed or where the the cost just no longer no longer makes sense and so without making this a direct sales pitch for priori what we offer is a way to be onboarded what we see companies doing in order to try and address that problem and i'm sure there are others i'm curious aaron and lonnie how you've seen that addressed but what we see is companies coming to us and onboarding us to the panel so that they have a single vendor that remains accountable for the wide range of work that can't be accounted for in a convergence initiative or in a panel program. I, so, so sorry, um, for us, Casey, um, you know, we, we have, following the mortgage crisis, we had you know, significant increases in volume and we had to figure out a way um, to manage all that work going from you know, 3,000 litigation cases um, in at any given time to 14,000 litigation cases at any given time. Um, so, you know, we needed to have that nationwide coverage. Um, and, you know, some of it was repetitive work. Of course, you know, every client, every plaintiff um, might have different fact scenarios, but the larger firms, you know, with nationwide coverage were really helpful to us um, in a high volume, um, but single plaintiff environment. Um, and then of course, you know, you have your, your more high risk cases, um, which we also have, you know, panels for uh, whether it's securities lawyers or mortgage lawyers or consumer, uh, whatever that might be. But, you know, to your point about that local flavor, I mean, of course, you know, if you're in litigation or, um, you know, have a case in Montana, you're going to need Montana counsel. Um, so, you know, we do have a range, um, like Aaron said, you know, you have to meet the needs of, of the client, right? So, um, you know, at some cases, those big firm environments and high volume work for somewhat repetitive work is really helpful. Um, but we do have um, minority owned firms. We have regional counsel, um, you know, that, that help us, um, you know, nationally, which is great. Well, and Basha, I, I kind of want to dig in on this question because for a long time the refrain was we hire lawyers not law firms and then uh legal ops folks came in and all of a sudden we were creating kind of business to business relationships where law depart departments hired law firms and there is uh can all kinds of tension in there in terms of when when do we hire individual lawyers when do we hire firms and also the role that legacy relationships play in a, in a whole number of things, including uh, diversity uh, and the use of women and minority owned firms or even individual diverse attorneys within large firms. And so I know that since you, that you come in to do, to kind of disintermediate in particular ways, um, a, lot of, a lot of traditional hiring practices, you might have some opinions on the seven questions I just asked. I have opinions on all of them, and I just can't uh, can't figure out which one I want to tackle first. But um, I'm a linear thinker, so I'll I'll start at the beginning. Uh, a core part of our thesis, as you know, is that you hire the lawyer, not the law firm, and I I think that's mostly true. Um, and I think that might even be true if you are executing a convergence initiative. It's, it, these firms often have thousands of attorneys at them. 
And it is only a matter of getting to know those attorneys rather than thinking, oh, I'm going to go hire Scadden or Baker or whatever it is. But instead, I, I still think the thought process is I'm going to go hire Mary or Joe. Um, and I that and I, I, I think that part of the diversity challenge right now is allowing in-house teams ways to get to better know rising diverse superstars in the ranks of their preferred firms and partnering with those firms to championing their advancement. I mean, like asterisk, there are a lot more problems um, that are more deeply entrenched in both society and the profession that we can't tackle. But that's one small way to get at um, to get at the diversity problem and also to think about to, to, to say that, you know, maybe there's a little bit of tension, but I still think it's the way that in-house teams are thinking about those kinds of relationships part of what we do at priori right we're not playing in that space if you're in if you're engaged in a multi-billion dollar litigation though one day i would hope you would come to priori i am not expecting that softbank or bank of america are currently considering us what is the case though is that once you're out playing outside of that land um, once it's not about Baker or Scadden or Wachtell or whatever, and instead it's about I have a problem, who can solve it? I'm not sure that in-house teams care that much. And again, correct me if I'm wrong, um, whether someone's at a three-person firm or a 25-person firm or 75-person firm, as long as they meet your information security requirements and they are carrying the requisite amount of practice insurance, it's more, does this person have the expertise to solve my problem? Um, I do think there is still like, you know, the nobody ever got fired for hiring McKinsey mentality in the industry, but I do think changing a little bit um, and that it it is for those very significant bet the company cases and for the rest of legal work as there's more and more cost sensitivity I think that you know maybe it's the exception it's the maybe it was it five percent that wasn't accounted for by the 130 um, or so firms the the five percent of spend that actually is quite a lot of money um, that can be done in, that can be performed in a different way. And I think that percentage personally is going to creep up over the coming years. I, I worry, Casey, that I gave you a rambling answer to your very, um, could, could I, ju could I jump in? Absolutely. Because I think that, I think Basha makes a great point. Um, and one of the <laughs> things that I think you're, you're, you're observing Basha is there's no monolithic marketplace for legal services in uh, the US or in the world for that matter. And so I think one of the advantages of practicing today is that we have tools that allow us to get a real understanding of the kinds of resources that are available to meet needs on a localized basis for particular matters. And whether that it involves working with, um, you know, like a group like Priori, Priori that has resources, you know, all across the, the country that can, uh, you know, put their expertise toward particular matters, or whether it means, you know, leveraging a big firm that might be handling, you know, a multinational transaction or uh, multinational litigation that has that kind of scale. Um, I think, you know, people in the legal operations space and, you know, uh, uh, through that, in-house um, have a variety of tools that make it easier to find the right resource for the right um, uh, type of uh, work that they're doing at the right pricing today than they did you know 10 years ago or 15 years ago um, and i think one of the advantages that you get through panel programs um, is getting consistent data that allows you to make those choices. Right. Um, it, you know, it, it's very difficult to, you know, compare the relative expertise or the relative value of, um, you know, resources in the legal space or in any other space. If the data that you're receiving on, you know, what that expertise is, what that pricing is, um, you know, where the resources are based, uh, isn't coming in on a consistent basis. 
And so, um, it, you know, I think there is a, a huge benefit to putting some structure in place as to how you, you know, select and price your legal services, whether they're coming from big law, whether they're coming from, uh, you know, more innovative players like Priori or, um, you know, ALSPs or uh, technology-based players, you know, just having that structure in place to help guide the decision-making process, I think is enormously useful. So Lonnie. Yeah, and Basha, I, I would just add, um, you know, for us, I would say that we hire the firm more than the lawyer. Um, by way of example, you know, we've had, you know, significant partners that you know, we worked with consistently over a period of time that maybe leave um, that firm to go to another firm that's maybe not on our approved list. Um, so, you know, in, in most cases, I mean, it almost all of the cases, we would you know, stick with that existing law firm and the team because we don't want to put all of our chips in kind of one attorney's niche subject matter expertise. Um, we are relying on the team. And it's not only that individual, but you know, th that's when diversity comes into play too, not just with our minority owned firms, but also with our majority firms. Who, who's on the team from a diversity standpoint? Who's leading the team? Um, you know, we're asking those questions constantly about uh, leadership of teams, including, you know, who, who are the women and minorities that might we might partner with? Um, you know, it's also beyond just litigation and regulatory as well. So we're working with a lot of firms that, you know, have, have multi-relationship client um, you know, relationships in that, you know, they might be doing transactional work with us, um, high yield equities, as well as, you know, having a different, um, you know, group doing, you know, litigation or employment work. Um, so I would, I would definitely say in, in response to Ian's um, chat that, you know, we are more focused on volume um, and, and relationship based approach at a firm level, um, rather than just working with individual attorneys. Well, and I, I want to dig into that um, because you you also referenced it in your in your opening about uh, sticking with firms and shaping their uh, their behavior. So using the structure and the data that Aaron just just referenced to 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 shape behavior and and not just lower costs, but diversity, improved service delivery, various value adds, like being able to use their conference rooms. Um, what are the, what are the behaviors? that you focus on shape, uh, shaping, what levers um, do you find most useful in doing so? You reference competition among firms. Yeah. Uh, what metrics are you looking at and, ident and using to identify opportunities for improvement? Like how do you engineer effective feedback loops? And then to throw in one question that was, that was in the uh, chat, which I think we, we all know the answer to. And, and how do you respond if your firms don't want to, for example, share the demographic data of the people working on your matters. Um, that's an interesting, you know, question that um, we we are as a banking industry. Um, some of you may know that uh, the general counsels from a lot of the financial institutions just came out with. Um, a letter with uh, various diversity commitments um, about uh, working with minority owned firms about staffing their matters um, with um, you know, diverse attorneys, minorities and women. Um, you know, so I think um, not only from Bank of America, but from City and JPM and Goldman and others, um, you know, all of the leadership is committed, um, you know, to diversity efforts. Um, you know, for us, I would say, um, in an environment where the OCC and our regulators are really focused, um, you know, not on just third party management, which would be your your outside counsel, but who they're retaining as well, maybe our expert population. You know, so we're focusing on information security um, quite a bit um, to make sure that our, our law firms are being managed, um, you know, again, and keeping our confidential information confidential. Um, you know, this relationship based approach is helpful. Um, you know, I don't, we, we do a lot of our billing on fixed fees. Um, you know, it's not a gotcha moment. It's not, um, you know, 
that we pay only X amount for this type of, of work. Um, so we definitely have more of a relationship based approach with our law firms to you know, negotiate budgets, to negotiate fixed fees. Um, and then going back to you know, diversity uh, initiatives, um, I'm one of the co-chairs of our diversity and inclusion business council. And we are um, you know, hyper focused on you know, not only supporting and sponsoring um, you know, diverse and uh, of affiliates and, and national affinity groups, um, but working with our law firms to get more diversity. Um, again, not just you know, diverse associates, but diverse leadership, um, both women and minorities. Um, we track all this information. We ask all of our law firms to give us very detailed information um, at the partner level, at the associate level, at the council level of who is who's staffing on our matters, who's staffed on our matters. And we do do a side by side comparison and let them know how they're performing in comparison with their peers. So that drives results, as I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, if they're underperforming in diversity, then you know, we, we challenge our law firms on that through our performance review process. Um, so through our diversity and inclusion business council, we may have somebody from the council work directly with the diversity head at that law firm, you know, to understand maybe what their challenges are. Um, you know, are they unable to, you know, re retain women for some reason, or are they unable to, you know, bring on diverse talent um, and retain them? Is it a promotion issue? So, you know, we want to, as the client, give um, diverse attorneys and women that visibility to our lawyers. So they, you know, again, taking the law firm approach rather than the individual attorney approach, you know, to make sure that our lawyers understand, um, you know, who their diverse strategic partners are um, and who we can use on our matter from a team relationship based approach. Um, so we are really driving results on diversity. We're driving results on information security, on uh, value based billing. Um, and those are the, you know, I would say the, the top three things that, you know, we're really seeing um, driven results. Well, so another tool, Aaron, that often gets mentioned, but wasn't mentioned just there is RFPs. Um, and very, I would say a fairly controversial topic because they're used with great frequency, not just to set up panels, but once panels are already set up to select which panel firms is going to do a particular bit of work. Uh, why have RFPs become more and more popular? And yet, why is there pushback? You know, a lot of people suggesting that they're kind of a form of kabuki theater that wastes a lot of time and energy for everyone involved. So do good RFP processes exist? Um, and, and if so, what do they look like? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So I think, um, it, you know, particularly in the early days of legal operations and leveraging RFPs more to manage outside counsel, um, there was probably a learning curve that a lot of consumers of legal services and their law firms went through. Um, and, uh, you know, we recognize, uh, you know, I think as legal operations professionals, uh, good ones do, that it is um, quite a bit of effort to put together a response to an RFP, particularly given that you know there are firms that are producing dozens of these in response to the needs of you know dozens of their clients all the time, and and there are no consistent standards, right? So I think one of the benefits of organizations like ACC and Clock has been to probably make. Uh, the kind of information that's requested in RFPs and RFIs more consistent so that firms can respond to them more efficiently, right? And as, um, you know, the maturity of the legal operations profession has in in increased and as, you know, law firms have gotten more accustomed to it, I think some of that incremental burden has come down, but you can, you can always do better. And so, you know, I, I tried to uh, limit the use of RFPs and RFIs in the work that I do to um, really two circumstances. One is um, establishing the panel of outside counsel. So in connection with that, we do need the information that is provided in an RFP and RFI 
regarding the firms that are participating in the process. So we can compare the different firms on an apples to apples basis. And we do need the uh, pricing information as well. So that again, you know, we can benefit from some of that competition and our firms can benefit from some of that competition that Lonnie was describing, you know, that is a characteristic of the uh, marketplace that we operate in. Um, but outside of establishing the panel, we really do try to limit the um, use of RFPs to those really significant matters where um, we might benefit by getting more information regarding the particular expertise of the firm for something that's really unique or innovative or impactful to the company. And so uh, conducting you know, a smaller uh, competition among some of our firms that we believe may be well positioned to provide service on that so that we can get to know their expertise better um, is uh, you know something that I think showcases the benefit of RFPs. Um, and, and I think also, you know, as over the last 10, 15 years, the legal marketplace has gotten more sophisticated. Um, at least the larger firms have developed the capability to respond to these um, relatively quickly. So they've built up their business development teams uh, inside uh, you know, their organizations that have been able to you know, respond to RFPs and RFIs in a systematic way. Yeah, it, it does uh, impose a burden. Uh, I recognize that and it probably falls uh, with you know, increased impact on smaller players in the ecosystem. Yeah, I, I just want to jump in on that, respond to a question in the chat, and then circle back on to clarify something I said earlier. Uh, the first, I, I, I completely agree with you, Aaron. I, I think it makes sense as part of the initial, um, the initial function of establishing a set of preferred providers, and then only for the largest matters. I would also add, however, and this perhaps is, is a plea um, for in-house teams to only include the firms that are really realistic contenders rather than to invite 50 firms to participate in RFP. We're part of, you know, we're a small company, we have about 20 employees and we get asked to participate in RFPs and for a while we responded to every single one of them. Um, and then what started to happen is there are companies that did that consistently and nobody ever got back to us. We would spend 20 hours and a 20 person team putting together an RFP, trying to win a big piece of work. And not only do you never hear back, you don't get anything back. And eventually I think what happens is it has a suppressive effect on your market. Maybe there is an RFP that we would be perfect for, but if we spend 20 hours two or three times and we don't get any response, we're just gonna stop responding because we, can't, we, we, we quite literally can't afford it. So, you know, I, I think that really being intentional with who's included in RFPs and communicating with them perhaps about why they've been included or what your objectives are and making it more of a collaborative process is certainly something else that I would institute. Um, you know, and I would say, I, I certainly think it's the case that, um, that these larger firms, it is the case that these larger larger firms have whole teams of people who are dedicated now to responding to RFPs. But I've had probably a good 20 of these conversations in the last two months uh, with firms from across the AMLA 1 and 200. They all see it as a really significant drain on their resources. It's costly and that cost is going somewhere. <laughs> Just, you know, and it's, you know, and, and they have to, they now have to build it in. And so when there are companies, you know, there are companies out there who have that they RFP every work that they anticipate is going to be more than $25,000. Um, that is driving cost up for everybody. I do yeah. think RFPs have a place, but I think that, um, they, they, they need to be constrained and done thoughtfully. In response to Richard's question in the chat, which, which um, aligns with this, that, that is exactly part of Priori's goal, but part of Priori's goal also, uh, the question was it, uh, whether it was uh, an objective for Priori to obtain more RFPs for smaller firms. Um, part of our goal also is to use data to make matches 
to reduce the burden on those smaller firms to reply. If you're a one person firm, you, you, you can't reply to these RFPs. Your, your time is your money. Um, so what we do is we try and collect extensive data, both at the attorney level and at the firm level um, about the, the, our, the, the, the firms on our platform in order to suggest matches to in-house teams for who is applicable. And I just wanna circle back on the point about hiring a lawyer versus the firm, because I think there, there's a bunch of, of chatter. Um, I certainly think it's the case that for high volume work, um, it, you're hiring the, the, the firm or the ALSP, you are not hiring an individual. Um, and I also don't think there's a tension necessarily between having a, um, having an approach that's team-based and caring about who's on that team. I think who's on that team is exactly what matters, whether it's their expertise, whether it's the characteristics that help you, know, help you achieve your diversity goals, whether it is about the fact that you finally, you know, you found a, some associates who are responsive to you in a way that makes your in-house team happy. Law is still a people business. Um, and different, and and I, I I think that it is um, we we that that they are not they are not in tension with one another, but as Aaron said, depending on the need and the company and the kinds of legal needs that arrive that arise on a regular basis, you're looking at different different balances. Could could I jump Could I jump in? There's there, there's some really rich content uh, that Basha just uh, highlighted that I'd just like to comment on. One is uh, about a dynamic that I I've observed, you know, in the legal space and in other markets uh, over the past few years that I think, you know, Priori has really showcased um, and I think will continue to accelerate, which is, you know, how do we solve this problem in our industry of um, you know managing repetitive processes across different participants in the industry and the RFP um, question the RFP RFI question is a great example of that right because historically there haven't been consistent standards there hasn't been you know one warehouse or clearinghouse of information but you know like as you see in a lot of marketplaces over time you know people do recognize that and they see the value of providing that and you know, I think that you know, one of the things that I, I really find exciting about Peori is that it does give that clearinghouse and that marketplace to participants who might not otherwise be able to access it. And there's another company based in Canada that does this outside of the legal space called Tealbook, which is basically you know organizing all of the information about different providers for procurement purpose, purposes in a common consistent way so that companies can access it, you know, without having to go through multiple RFPs or RFIs, they just go to that single source of information and the participants in it are able to provide that information, you know, once or maybe once annually. And um, then you become a verified provider and they provide that service for a fee. I, I think there's a, a huge benefit to having that in terms of reducing the friction of you know participating in those processes and getting consistent information. But you know we need consumers of legal services to buy into it. Um, and I think there's a similar challenge in the diversity area that I've seen in terms of you know how different organizations are measuring diversity and so you know one of the things that Lonnie observed in terms of you know different leaders in the financial services space coming together port for an approach um, I, I think that's great progress um, you know because to the extent that diverse providers of services know how they're going to be measured um, in terms of you know how their diversity in legal services is delivered um, that allows people to um, you know be able to participate more meaningfully and respond more meaningfully when people are looking for you know information on how they can organize diversity programs 
Great. Yeah, one other thing I, I, I want to just say I wholeheartedly agree with, with Basha on the RFP process, like making sure that you have the right people involved and not just adding in people, um, you know, getting information that you actually need. Um, I mean, I don't want to waste anybody's time, uh, of course. On the flip side, you know, I would ask, um, you know, law firms something similar is that don't oversell yourself. Right. So, um, you know, if you if you're looking to, you know, do a particular piece of litigation work or, um, you know, uh, IP litigation or employment law, you know, really focus on what you're known for, where your niche subject matter expertise is. Don't tell me you can do my IP work, my mortgage work, my equities work. And you have like one partner here, here and here and all over the country. Um, you know, just because you have somebody to do the work doesn't mean that that's your, you know, niche practice. So, you know, in the response, um, and I'm talking about not at the matter level, but, you know, getting to know new firms, you know, uh, the question is, how do smaller firms get access to RFPs? You know, I really want to know what you're known for, what your niche practice is, who your key partners are. Um, and, you know, no offense to marketing teams, but, you know, when I send those big books of multiple lawyers and multiple practice areas across to, you know, my lawyers, you know, they're not going to read it. Um, I always ask for what I call a placemat, um, which really focuses on three practice areas um, that you really want to focus on um, in getting work from us uh, with who the partners are, where they're located, what the subject matter expertise is, so that I can get a full picture of key partnerships or potential key partnerships um, on one page. So sorry to all the marketing people out there. Yeah, well, there's a there's a great joke of a, an associate goes into a partner and asks, what, what kind of law do we practice here? To which the partner says, door law. Associate says, door law, I've never heard of that. He's like, oh, it's very simple. If it comes through the door, we practice it. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 and with that, I of course have a million more questions, but I'm sure our audience does too. Um, so to keep our commitment to reserve the last 15 minutes for Q&A, uh, I'm going to move us to Q&A, though I assure you that, that if, if, if you're shy, uh, though you don't seem to be in the chat, uh, that, that, that I will have uh, more questions for our panelists. I have no doubt they have questions for each other. Um, so, um, one, so Jennifer asks, what are other resources like a field book that have share re resources ab about firm vendor uh subject subject matter uh uh who, who wants to take this is there is there any uh so i'm gonna ask the two in-house folks right now are there are there any resources like directory types online portals anything that you look at <laughs> <laughs> That we're going to come to you in a second with the same question, but are there things that you actually look at? Because there's a million directories out there. There's awards. There's. Are there any things that you or people affiliated with you look at when you're searching for outside counsel? Who should we include in this RFP? Um, who might make it on our panel? There was a question earlier about how do you identify minority-owned firms and what expertise they have. What are the resources that, that, you, that you go to and you, you know, re remember the name of the webinar. There's one you should probably mention. Yeah. <laughs> All right, no, go but, ahead, Eric. Well, don't mention us. I'll, no, I'll do no absolutely. I, I think the services that you offer are amazing. Um, you know, for, for us, I wouldn't say that there's like one book or, or resource that, you know, we would, you know, go to to find firms because, you know, firms come to us all the time, you know, to you know, meet with us, talk about their subject matter expertise. So, you know, we're definitely getting that information, you know, directly either, um, uh, you know, from the firms themselves. Um, I would say that, you know, some of the things that resources we do use um, are more affinity groups like the National Bar Association, NAPABA, um, you know, the Hispanic uh, Bar Association, um, as well as the NAMWOLF organization, which I think is a great organization because, you know, I can find out 
Um, you know, a large financial institution is looking for um, a minority owned law firm that is practicing um, ESG related um, you know, work. And I get responses back as to here are the law firms that do this. Um, so, so that's a great organization just because they pre-vet it for you. Um, you know, there's no solo practitioners um, in the organization, um, but you know you're getting um, you know, minority owned, either women or minority, um, and uh, you know, you're getting quality legal services. So those type of organizations I rely on more than I would say um, booklets. Aaron, what about you? I, I agree. I, there, there are some members of um, uh, legal teams that I've worked with uh, who do um, rely on chambers uh, when they are looking in um, jurisdictions or in particular practice areas where they haven't had a lot of experience before. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think, um, again, um, if that's a resource that my clients find valuable, um, then, uh, you know, obviously we leverage it. Uh, but for the most part, um, I, I tend to think that, you know, one of the uh, primary responsibilities of legal operations is to compile that information internally um, mm -hmm. so that you can understand. And Lonnie, you did a great job of describing, you know, that internal feedback loop that you have with your law firm. So you understand which of the firms that you work with are meeting your needs, where there are opportunities for improvement, what your internal clients think of those firms, and then having all of that information available so that your team can use that when they're making selections, I think is incredibly valuable. But in terms of you know, uh, diverse data, yeah, NamWolf is a great resource. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think obviously, uh, you know, Priori, provides a, an incredible service here in basically um, coordinating that activity on behalf of a lot of providers in the ecosystem in a consistent way so that we can go to one resource for that uh, as opposed to trying to have uh, trying to find among you know like a, a very uh, fractured market um, you know across the country um, that particular resource that meets needs for uh, you know, a particular need, which can be very time consuming otherwise. And this is one of the, you know, I, I think ob obviously a priori, but I think it's one of the problems that we're interested in in the longer term too. So, you know, right now the problem that we address is identifying new attorney talent where you don't have pre-existing relationships, primarily with small and mid-sized firms and flexible secondment style work. Um, and that's uh, and I, and and that that's how our clients currently rely on us. One of the problems that interests us going forward, and I think, is of the utmost importance to the industry, both in terms of diversity, but also more broadly, is creating a centralized way to better understand all the different kinds of questions that you have about your attorneys and firms in in centralized databases and i you know that's something that we're thinking about but it's also something that lots of other players in the ecosystem are thinking about all the litigation data providers are trying to think about this mm -hmm. um all the uh everyone uh david david cunningham at legal metrics is trying to think about this um all from different vantage points i'm sure there there are other examples of this as well different ways of displaying you know public m a data um and i i think that we we're, we're at this interesting moment in in the industry where we're we're all trying really hard to come up with data but we are not at a point where it's actionable um in in lots of for a lot, in lots of moments because it's it's disaggregated and it's not always the data you want it's not an essential resource and i don't think priori is going to be solving that problem on our own but i do think that that is something that will um, enable in-house teams to make better outside counsel hiring decisions. It will reduce the ultimate cost uh, and reduce burden on law firms who are providing hyper granular data to their hundreds of clients who all want it sliced and diced in different in different combinations. And I think if we can provide ways and Priori wants to play our part in this, um, of putting that data in a more centralized 
searchable, actionable format um, that will be a way to have a resource that that would be a great resource. Yeah. There, there's, a, there's actually a very large aggregator of data um, that is providing a similar resource today on sort of an experimental basis to some of its business customers. Uh, it's, it's led by a gentleman named Jeff Bezos. Bezos, I believe his name is. <laughs> um, he, he's he's quite innovative, but it, actually, you know, I mean, it's 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 kind of fascinating if it, like in the, some of the uh, quieter areas or the you know uh, niche areas of the legal marketplace, you do see commentary on this. Amazon has been, you know, on you know sort of a small basis, limited to IP, making uh, you know a pre-vetted panel of IP providers available mm -hmm. to its business customers. And, you know, I mean, I've, I've thought for quite some time that it's only a matter of time before that expands. Now, it, it might not necessarily be appealing to everybody, but there is, I think, you know, if you if you look at the legal marketplace, there's a huge uh, marketplace for services that's not, uh, you know, pr provided for or participated in by large consumers of legal services like Bank of America or SoftBank. Um, you know, there are lots of smaller uh, businesses that are consuming legal services that can benefit from a solution like that. Um, and, um, you know, it, it does uh, serve some of the goals that we've been talking about today, competition, market pricing, data. Well, and if I heard Bashara right, we're, we're on the precipice, but we're not quite there yet. Our, our esteemed host asked the question in the chat, if, if any of you have had ex experience using predictive analytics to make your to make your selection of of outside uh, counsel, and and if so, have you you know have, have you found them to be valuable? We have not. Um, you know, we uh, again, you know, have a small number of firms um, kind of identified um, and pre vetted. Um, you know, either through RFPs or some other resource. Um, so, you know, we've kind of narrowed the scope um, already to a smaller number of firms that we partner with. Um, and in terms of like cost per case analysis, um, you know, in the context of complex regulatory litigation, you know, capital markets, whatever it is, um, you know, it's just, it's just too, it's, it's too difficult to automate that. And it kind of goes against our relationship based approach with our law firms. Um, so we have not used those automated predictive um, analytics um, other than, you know, we use obviously companies in the e-discovery case, um, you know, space that, you know, use predictive um, review. So, so this is this is an area I think there's also a lot of rich potential in. Um, you know, in order to do predictive analytics well, you have to have a very large data set for you know, like right. the ability to generate something that's statistically meaningful out of it. And you have to have you, you know that that means by definition you have to have certain types of matters with common attributes across that large data set. So, um, you know, uh, in, in uh, one of my prior roles, um, I was fortunate to work for a company that did have that kind of data and we were building out the ability to leverage predictive analytics to understand, you know, which firms were consistently getting the best outcomes on uh, similar kinds of cases. And, you know, what did that mean in terms of, you know, both the overall result, you know, for uh, the company on the litigation, but also the cost and being able to basically say, okay, if we have this kind of case in a particular jurisdiction, we know that, you know, typical firm would be able to, you know, get a resolution for, you know, like X amount um, in terms of investment in right. legal fees. Um, and then you can see what, who the outliers are. You can right. see who, who the ones are that do better and who the ones are that do worse. Uh, but, you, but you need a, a huge volume of 
work across, you know, the same kinds of matters in order for that to be meaningful. This is where I think, you know, Basha, you were describing the litigation aggregators. I think there's there's a huge opportunity there that's kind of in its infancy because, you know, you have all that information in court cases, um, but it's not collected in a consistent way. So I think there's some really exciting companies that are doing good work to understand, you know, what does it look like to get, you know, like, uh, result in Los Angeles County for, you know, and which firms are doing the better jobs. And that works for the, for what I'd call the higher volume or single plaintiff type of work uh, for sure. Right. Because, you know, you can, and we're a de a definitely a data driven company. So we're not using any type of predictive modeling or coding or um, tool to do that. But, you know, we have our own data, you know, that we can cut and paste to, you know, determine for those single plaintiff cases across the country, what's the resolution cycle time, you know, who is, what law firms are, um, you know, resolving cases quicker. What's the average, um, you know, cost per resolution? Um, you know, what what's what's the cost per case? Um, so that's definitely easier to do um, in that high volume market. But once you start getting to high risk cases, um, you know, that change over time and might have joint defense agreements, it's it's impossible to use those tools in any. Um, you know, accurate way. Yeah, yeah it, I, it, it, sorry, go ahead. Bonnie. No, go for it, Aaron, sorry. I was just gonna say it, it, it kind of echoes the theme that we started off describing, which is that, you know, there's no one size fits all tool yeah. for uh, these areas. You really have to define the particular problem you're trying to solve uh, in a specific way, and then, you know, identify the right tools that solve that problem. And, you know, you'll have lots of different tools that you confront in legal operations. Right. I, the thing, what I, what I was going to say is that I, I completely agree works for high volume cases, more harder to apply for complex, higher risk cases. But I think the other thing that we think a lot about is also how you can apply that kind of, those kinds of analytics outside of a litigation context. And specifically, as you can pro probably imagine, um, we see a lot of commercial contract review, negotiation, overflow support that comes through the Priori platform. And one of the conundrums for us is that we'll have attorneys who are extraordinarily highly reviewed by one client or two clients or three clients, and then they get a more negative review from a different client. And it happens in it, it happens all the time, and it's not consistent. Uh, it's, it's not that there's, you know, one or two difficult clients, they like a different type of lawyer. Mm -hmm. And how you spend time defining what, what the goal is, um, and communicating that and what the company likes, what the company's expectations are. Um, are they looking at, you know, I mean, at the simplest level, are they looking for a very heavy legal markup? Or are they looking to be more business forward? How do they want the attorney to communicate? And these are things that are business critical, for us, um, and so we're spending a lot of time thinking about it, but I, I think that the analytics haven't quite gotten there yet. And so um, I'm not sure this one's gonna be our problem to solve, but I would certainly be interested in others in the space who are thinking about um, how to evaluate other kinds of legal work and rate other kinds of legal work and think about how to match between business goal and attorney orientation. Well, it's, that's a perfect way to end, which is not every problem has been solved, not even by this amazing panel. Uh, we are on time, uh, and I very much want to thank all our panelists. You were uh, amazing, and uh, thanks to all the attendees. Again, you're welcome to follow up with us, um, but it, this was absolutely wonderful. Thank you, thank you so very much. And thank you to our host, Bob. Thanks, Thank Colin. you, everybody. Thanks, Thank you. Good to see you, Lonnie. Good to see you, Vasha. Good to see you. Good to see you. So long, everybody. Bye -bye.